in action. Okay, please state your name, how old you are, and how old you were in 1998. My name is Father Ron Fossage. I was I'm 64, and I was 51. I wrote this down to make sure. 51. 51, when it happened? When it happened. Okay. Um, is Jasper your hometown? No, I grew up in St. Louis, Missouri. Okay. But I've been in Jasper 26 years. 26 years. Okay. What brought you to Jasper? Um, my religious community has always been the priest here at this church. Mm -hmm. We serve parishes where there are very few Catholics. Okay. And I was, I was a teacher in Belleville, Illinois for 10 years. Mm -hmm. And then I went to Salford, Louisiana, and then I was asked to be pastor here. Okay. Um, so, did you, did you ever consider leaving Jasper, or well, do you like the community? I, I, we, we usually only get to stay 12 years, so I've been okay. very blessed. Um, mm -hmm. Usually a priest can only stay 12 years in a place, and mm -hmm. because of everything that's happened here, and because I really do like it here, and because mm -hmm. I have four churches, a lot of young men do not want to do four churches, so mm -hmm. they've left me here because nobody else wants to come. All right. Well, what four churches do you have? I have Jasper, Kirbyville, Rayburn, and Toledo Village. Okay. I'm also the chaplain at the hospital here because it's Catholic, mm -hmm. and I'm the chaplain at the Goodman Unit, uh, the Catholic chaplain at the Goodman Unit, which is right outside of town. Mm -hmm. It's a state prison. Okay. So you, you stay very busy. I do. I do. What else are you involved in? I play violin in a little orchestra. Mm -hmm. uh, it's called the Vernon Parish Community Orchestra in Leesville. Okay. And we have several concerts in Jasper. Mm -hmm. um, and and I cut grass for about 26 elderly people. Wow. Do you do that um, to make extra money or no. community service? Community service. That's awesome. Yeah. Where do you find the time to do everything? Well, <laughs> luckily, I'm not married and I don't have children, so. Do so you have extra time? I do, I do have a little During extra time. Week, yes. Okay. All right. Well, um, let's move on to our questions. How were you connected to the murder of James Bird Jr.? I was a member of the Ministerial Alliance, and okay. we had met for many, many years, and we're very, very active. And um, thank goodness we have one Ministerial Alliance. When I travel around, we found out that in many communities they have an African American Ministerial mm -hmm. Alliance and a white minister. We never had that here. I was very close to Kenneth Lyons and mm -hmm. to um, Brother John and several of the African American ministers. Mm -hmm. um, we we became very active. I was also the pastor to Ronald King, John King's father, okay. and to the district attorney, Guy mm -hmm. James Gray. And so uh, it was a, a unique situation being a pastor to both of those because um, Guy James Gray was fighting for the death penalty of mm -hmm. Ronald King's son. Mm -hmm. um, so and that was kind of unique. Explain that. How did that work, the dynamics? Of that well, um, it, it was really interesting because um, the night that Guy James Gray got the death penalty was mm -hmm. on a Friday morning. On Saturday evening, they were sitting together back to back in church, mm -hmm. and at the kiss of peace, Guy James reached over and hugged mm -hmm. Ronald King, and, and oh. Ronald knew that there was no animosity. He was mm -hmm. doing his job, and uh, mm -hmm. there was a reporter here from Austin at that time, mm -hmm. and she just couldn't believe. In fact, she wrote a story about it that that Ronald and, and Guy James could even speak to one another, much less hug each other. But but that was true throughout the trial. I sat with Ronald King in the trial because he was he had severe asthma mm -hmm. and he was in a wheelchair and none of his family would have anything to do with the trial. Mm -hmm. So he asked me if I would go with him every day and I did. Mm -hmm. But we sat on the right hand side of the courtroom and uh, uh, the Bird family sat on the left-hand side in the front pew, and every time a Bird member came by, they, they stopped and talked to Ronald. It mm -hmm. was very, very religiously impressive because there was no animosity. They, right. they hated what his son did, but they mm -hmm. didn't hate him. Mm -hmm. In fact, the first time we met as ministers, uh, Brother Lyons brought Mr. Um, Bird, mm -hmm. and he said to us, the very first thing he said, I'll never forget it, he said, my family is hurting, we're not hating. Okay. And they certainly lived after. Right, throughout the whole... Yes, they did. They were... The yes. Like. I mean, our town would have burnt to the ground if it wasn't for them. Mm -hmm. Great. Because when the KKK came and the Black Panthers came, mm -hmm. it was a tragic time. And um, if it wasn't for their leadership in the community, mm -hmm. uh, things would have been different. A lot different. Okay. 
you want to follow up to that question that you'd like to ask? Um, I'll ask you later. Okay. All right. Um, so you know that we're comparing what Jasper was like just right after it happened to, say, what Jasper is like right now. Um, can you just kind of paint a picture, like, as far as um, the people who are living here, the racial makeup of the town, and also um, economics? Well, our town is almost 50-50. It's, it's, I think it's, what, 50% white and 49% mm -hmm. African-American and 1% or 2% Hispanic. Okay. It's difficult to decide how many Hispanics, because so many of them are illegal and they don't register. Mm -hmm. But we do have an awful lot of them attending our church. Okay. Um, after, I, I guess many of us in the white community lived with blinders because we didn't think things were very bad before okay. James Byrd's death. Mm -hmm. But as the African American ministers pointed out to us, you know, there were no black car salespersons, there were no blacks working in the courthouse, there were no blacks working in the banks, mm -hmm. uh, and yet they, they used all those facilities. And so we were unaware of that, or okay. blind to it, I suppose. Mm -hmm. and, Has uh, that changed now? Do you oh, have black car salesmen? And I, I believe you do. Bank? I know there's blacks working in the bank, because okay. I see them when they go to the bank, and mm -hmm. I know there's African Americans working in the courthouse. Okay. And so I think things have changed. Mm -hmm. I, I know shortly after, everyone tried to be extra kind to each other. Mm -hmm. I mean, mm -hmm. people would always say hello at the <laughs> post office and at Walmart. And How long did that last? Well, not long Maybe enough. Maybe a few months yeah. or a few years? Uh, I think certainly a few months. Few probably months. many more than a few months because the media was here so much of the time. Mm -hmm. And it, it, I think another thing that really changed this was the mayor formed this committee called Committee for One Jasper. Mm -hmm. And he appointed several of us who were kind of leaders in the community to be a part of it. But then he also opened it up to the citizens. Mm -hmm. The only requirement was that if you joined, you had to realize you were going to attend lots of meetings. And we certainly did have lots of meetings. Mm -hmm. But one of the things we did in the very beginning was the city council organized open town hall meetings in each of their districts and members of the committee for one jasper were asked to be present mm -hmm. we were told not to speak but to listen okay. and they had a series of questions that they asked the people who were in attendance mm -hmm. i attended all of them and, and they were really really eye-opening mm -hmm. uh, to attend the ones in the white community versus the ones in the African community. Very different. They were very, very oh, different. Do you remember any of the questions? Was that so long ago? I, I do, but I'm going to start crying if I talk oh, about them. But okay, well, one of the questions I'll, I'll never forget is this a white lady stood up mm -hmm. and said that she used to use the N-word a lot at home. Mm -hmm. mm. I stood up mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And she said her daughter came home from school and told her to stop using that word. Mm -hmm. After that happened. And she never used it again. Another thing that really happened was the federal government came in, and I forget the gentleman's name, but he was marvelous. He met with all of us all the time. And he organized a diversity training workshop for all the teachers that summer. Mm -hmm. And they had this diversity training workshop in the schools when the kids came back in September. And it I think it was a very, very good help. And it was something that I don't think we could have organized because mm -hmm. we didn't have the expertise, but because you know they could call in all these federal government mm -hmm. people. Uh, I think that really, really worked. I noticed a change in our kids because right. we have African American and Hispanic and, and whites in our church. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know the, the Hispanics always geared towards themselves and the African Americans towards themselves. And I noticed afterwards, like on Wednesday nights we have supper together and then we have religious ed. I noticed all of them were making a, a real effort to combine and not mm -hmm. stay in their little cliques. And I thought that was very helpful. Has that continued? Is that it has. It yes, has. it has. Mm -hmm. I just, so I think they learned something from it. The problem is, you know, they did it that year, but now all those kids are graduated and gone. Mm -hmm. And so it's, it's slowly going back. But I think even those kids had an effect on the younger kids mm -hmm. because the younger kids saw them making them a point to, to mix. Okay. And that was, I think that was very, very good. What about the economy? There are some of the changes. <sighs> Our economy is very, very bad. Mm -hmm. it, it, it has been bad. And I think until we can improve that, I don't think we're going to be able to improve these other issues because many of the African Americans are the lowest paid uh, 
it, because of the poor education I've been. Um, I, I deliver food to the poor every day, and sometimes I go into the um, uh, the apartment buildings, and um, I know in Martin Luther King Drive that I deliver food up there. I'm just amazed at how many young African Americans are walking around all day without jobs. And so, and, and I don't know how to improve that. You know, we pray about it. I know the mayor is trying to get new industry, mm -hmm. um, but it's not happening. Mm -hmm. And we've lost a couple of really big, you know, the, uh, the garage door company uh, moved out. The, the um, uh, lumber industry, mm -hmm. uh, they closed down a big plant, and that really has hurt. Mm -hmm. When did that happen? Uh, Several years ago, I think probably at the time of James Bird, or maybe even a little before, mm -hmm. shortly after. You're still filling those. Oh, I think so. Mm -hmm. There's there's high unemployment here. Mm -hmm. I don't know the number. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure what the number is. I was going to ask. Um, do you know if there's any initiative being taken by city council or by some of the current leaders about? as far as trying to bring in a manufacturing company? Or well, yes, they really are trying because two years ago, a group of those ministers met with a company that was coming in to, uh, that was going to diversify gas taken out of wood chips, I think. Okay. And, and Michael Al and the council really are working hard about that. I know every time he has a prospect, he always calls and asks for prayer. And then sometimes we've even met with some of his prospects um, trying to show them that the community is really behind this, and the churches are behind this. Mm -hmm. But so far, we have not, they have not been successful. Do you think people still remember what happened, and they decide so. they don't want to? I, I think so, and partly, lately, I was on this uh, committee last year to pr propose a $48 million bond issue to, to build a new school and to repair mm -hmm. the schools. Mm -hmm. The schools are in terrible shape. The, the junior high school is in terrible mm -hmm. shape. Mm -hmm. I mean, one night we were there and water was running down the walls and the elderly people wanted to use the elevator and couldn't because there was water in the elevator shafts. Uh, I don't know it's what... dangerous. The, oh, it is. Yeah. And, and, I mean, I think that campus is the worst. Mm -hmm. um, but the, the bond issue was severely defeated. And uh, I think our schools are also partly to blame that people are not coming here. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because people want their children to have sure. education in a nice sure. facility where they don't have to worry about them being electrocuted. Yeah. <laughs> Water being yeah. in the... Yeah, I can see that problem. And we have two beautiful schools. I mean, Q yeah. is beautiful, and the high school is in very good shape. But school. it's the junior high, and, and then Roe needs a lot of work as well. Mm -hmm. What about the hospital? We know that the hospital is older. Well, they're going to build a brand new facility, uh, uh, emergency room facility. They're supposed to break ground this summer. Okay, um, good. And they've poured a lot of money into the mm -hmm. hospital. They've completely renovated the inside. Mm -hmm. And they've brought some big name doctors from Lufkin mm -hmm. and Beaumont who come one day a week. Okay. So the hospital has made great strides. So it's just the outside appearance, but the right. inside. It's very, it's, it's very it's nice. really is nicely done. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Um, we'll go on to the next question. What about the uh, religious community at that time as far as churches? What were some of the larger African American churches at that time and the larger well, predominantly Anglo churches? Certainly Kenneth Lyons Church and John Hardin's church and Ray Lewis's church I would say were probably the largest and most influential African American. Mm -hmm. I think um, Hillcrest, which is right up the street, is certainly the largest Anglo church, mm -hmm. but they have very little influence in the town because their minister does not live here. Mm -hmm. He has chosen not to, to get involved at all in, mm -hmm. in anything. Mm -hmm. I think that's a real handicap for him and for our community because it is the largest church. Mm -hmm. I think at that time, probably First Baptist Church was the largest a uh, Anglo church. Mm -hmm. and. The United Methodist Church was certainly influential because it, uh, it tends to, a lot of wealthy people attend that church. Mm -hmm. I think our church was somewhat influential. We're certainly not the largest church by mm -hmm. any means, mm -hmm. but I participate in everything. Okay. Um, I go to all the functions, and, and um, I think because of my collar, people know I'm there. Whereas, yeah, a, you know, a, mm -hmm. uh, another minister who wears a suit coat, they yeah, don't know who he is. Mm -hmm. And so I think my collar has been partly, I mean, people know who I am because 
I stand out, not mm -hmm. because I've done anything great. Mm -hmm. But uh, that has been also very helpful, I think, to our community because um, a lot of people were ignorant to the Catholic Church, and there's a there's I mean there was some prejudice against us. Mm -hmm. e even when I first came, um, people would not speak to me because I was a Catholic priest, and mm -hmm. they had been told strange things about us. One of the things I think that really helped was uh, 15 years ago, like almost 20 years ago now, mm -hmm. uh, the ministers wanted to do a uh, an ecumenical event in January, and uh, they suggested that we exchange pulpits, and so mm -hmm. all the ministers were going to go to a different church on Sunday. Well, as a Catholic priest, I can't do that. Oh. I have to lead our conversation because mm -hmm. no one else can say mass. Mm -hmm. And so they decided, in order to accommodate me, mm -hmm. we were going to have what we called Sing with One Voice, and our church was going to host it, and all of the choirs from the local community were going to come one night oh, okay. and sing. Mm -hmm. It has been the most marvelous thing. Last year we had 16 choirs. We mm -hmm. had about six or seven hundred people here. And so that's still it's, it's still, still going on. on. We'll celebrate our 20, 20, 20, 20 years. Um, okay. Has it gotten larger or remained the same size? It, or? It's gotten larger. The problem is our church only holds 400 people, so we put chairs everywhere. Mm -hmm. But again, our parking lot only holds so many. Mm -hmm. We do use the parking lots of the church up, up the street, and we have shuttle service. That's great. But many times when people drive in and see no place to park or no place to stand, they leave. Mm -hmm. So, um, And our church is not the largest, but they they want to have it here because it's been here so long. Yeah, it's very, very nice. And, and, very and, nice and it's been a really... Uh, people who would never set foot in the Catholic Church have come mm -hmm. and have asked lots of questions and find out that there's more things that unite us than divide us. Great. So now do people speak to you? Oh, oh yes. <laughs> <laughs> now that they know you and <laughs> know your personality. Yeah, but when I first came, it was you could tell there was you know, a prejudice against Catholics, mm -hmm. too. What is the makeup of your church? Uh, it's probably getting more and more Hispanic. Mm -hmm. um, we have maybe 250 families. Mm -hmm. um, we have six African American families here, and we have about 12 or 15 African American families in Kirbyville. Okay. Uh, because Newton has a lot of African Americans, and the Catholics there tend to go to Kirbyville, it's a little closer. Okay. Um, our church here is predominantly white, okay. um, but it, it's becoming more and more Hispanic. Has it always been that part, that way, or when you first moved here, was it predominantly it, white? It was, and okay. there were not many Hispanics at that time. Mm -hmm. uh, but in, it, you know, if you're Catholic, there's no other church to attend, and you were nearby, so the African Americans who are Catholic have always come here. Okay, you have about six families. We have six families here, and about 12, 12 or 15 in Kirby. Okay. Good. Good number. I don't know if I answered your question. Yeah, you answered my question. <laughs> you did. Thank you. Um, what did you think of the media coverage? Um, we were scared to death when they first came because none of us had ever spoken before the cameras before. And mm -hmm. Luckily, Ed Robinson was the pastor of the First Baptist Church. And before mm -hmm. he became a Baptist minister, he was a weatherman on camera, oh, okay. on TV. So he, so he became our spokesperson. <laughs> and then he finally told us, you know, he said, if you don't speak to the cameras, they're going to speak to somebody. That's right. And so we began speaking to the cameras. And mm -hmm. it became somewhat easier because they all asked the same questions. Mm -hmm. But they still, there was a great bias because they would take your opening statement and your closing statement and add them together and mm -hmm. it's not really what you said. <laughs> the sound bite. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah, that's the media. Um, so I, I've heard that a lot of them came here looking for stereotypes. Did you feel that? Oh, we did. Yeah. Uh, you know, they didn't believe us. Like they didn't believe that we had sing with one voice for six years up until then. They thought that we put it together for them mm -hmm. because this, it happened two nights after uh, Bill King's trial began. So mm -hmm. all the media were in town. And we invited them to this because we wanted to show them that we were united, mm -hmm. that there were African American singers, and and at the very last song, all the ministers get up and sing. Mm -hmm. And I mean, we really are good friends, and mm -hmm. that was very evident. But the the media thought that that was all staged, okay. and and it wasn't. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, luckily we had the administrator of the hospital was African American, the mayor was African American. Walter Diggles, who took such a role. Um, we had lots of important people, mm -hmm. and those people could not have been put in office without the white vote. And so, uh, but there was certainly bias. 
I mean, they really thought we were redneck, <laughs> backwards people. But you know, the longer they stayed, the, the, they, their attitude changed because several of them wrote books, and, and I have all their books, but uh, I, I saw a difference in them because they would come and interview us a lot. Mm -hmm. and, and from the first interviews and the final interviews, mm -hmm. I don't think we changed, but I could see they changed. And once they realized you Yeah, that we were genuine and, and mm -hmm. we were very much like them. And, mm -hmm. uh, and, and, you know, this tragedy happened to us and we had no training how to deal with it. Mm -hmm. But y'all rose to the occasion. Yeah, and I think it was through prayer. Mm -hmm. I'll, I'll always remember every time Billy Rolls met with us, and we met with him often, mm -hmm. he always asked for prayer. That, that, was, that was important to us. Yeah, because some of the leaders who came from Washington and other places, they were not interested in praying at all. Mm -hmm. That became evident. So were that annoying to them, or would they, would they fall in line with the prayer? <laughs> well, they really wanted to take over and tell us what to do. Mm -hmm. I remember Jesse Jackson, when he came, he wanted to tell Kenneth Lyons that he was going to give the eulogy. And Kenneth Lyons says, no, you're not. This is my church. And those are my people. Mm -hmm. And, uh, oh, some of them, and, uh, they, I mean, they were really pushy. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So may I add something? Sure. I think when there were media and certain key leaders, whether they're state or nationally, mm -hmm. coming to rural areas of the South, mm -hmm. there's this assumption or stereotype that because of where it's positioned or the history of that community, they're not as prepared or educated to handle mm -hmm. a crisis or issue. And so, and so they end up kind of disrespecting the community key leaders by trying to mm -hmm. trying to put the fire out or trying to guide people when mm -hmm. those who are already here who are key leaders and have influence know mm -hmm. understand better how to lead the community. Because mm -hmm. those who maybe led people out of poverty or racial issues, it's a, still a different subculture. Mm -hmm. This is when they don't live in it anymore. Sure. So yeah. I just wanted to add that. Oh, good. That's a good point. Yeah. And, and we found that with Mr. and Mrs. Bird, so many Washington people came in and wanted to tell them what they should do, mm -hmm. and, and they told them that they felt very comfortable with with their church and with the, the police officers and the sheriff's department, mm -hmm. and they didn't they didn't want their influence. What church did they attend at the time? They, they attended Kenneth Lyons Church, okay. New Bethel, Greater New Bethel Baptist, mm -hmm. um, and then there was a falling out, which was really really sad. Mm -hmm. um, because when Mrs. Bird was buried, she was not buried from that church. And Kenneth Lyons, you won't find a finer pastor. And, uh, it was just a, a bad thing that the day of the uh, funeral, um, one of the reporters told Mrs. Bird that Kenneth Lyons Church, which is a rather poor church, mm -hmm. refused to pay for the meal afterwards, and that wasn't true. Kenneth, I mean, he didn't have the money to pay for everything. Mm -hmm. But I, I think that, and I could be wrong, but mm -hmm. I think that caused the a rift between the family and Kenneth, which mm -hmm. hurt Kenneth deeply, because he bent over backwards to be their leader and their spiritual director. Mm -hmm. And he did have the funeral at his church, and mm -hmm. um, he did the burial and did a marvelous job. Mm -hmm. I always make certain if I have to speak, I speak before Kenneth, <laughs> because it's tough to follow. He is a tough act to follow. He is. Okay. Um, so what is the most from the, the murder? I think we'll always be noted as the town where James Burke was put to death, was dragged to his death. Mm -hmm. um, I go on vacation every year back to St. Louis and a couple of years after that, because I bought my car here, mm -hmm. and had Jasper, Texas on the thing, and, and mm -hmm. several people came up and said, did you come from that town? Mm -hmm. I mean, I was surprised they still remembered. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. they really do. And, Kenneth Lyons and I have done a lot of hate crime seminars and I'm just amazed how people know our story mm -hmm. and usually know it pretty accurately. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think we'll always be remembered for that. Okay. Um, I'm going to wrap it up here and ask you questions. How do you see the future of Jackson? Uh, oh, I hope things improve for mm -hmm. everyone. I, I hope that economically, I think it's things improved economically, they would improve in so many different areas. Um, this present issue certainly has us all worried because mm -hmm. um, we don't know what, where it's going to go or what's going to happen. 
but it's almost going back and undoing all the work that we did. That was the, um, non, the black police chief. Yes. The black chief. Black chief. Black chief. Black chief. Black chief. Black chief. Okay, anything else that you can do about I, I'm very grateful that the ministries have stuck together. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, there's 54 churches in town, probably more than that now. Mm -hmm. When Dan Rather came, or, um, not Dan Rather, but the, when we had Nightline here, uh, and um, he, he spoke to the ministry beforehand, and when he found out at that time there were 54 churches, he said, how could this happen mm -hmm. in a town with 54 churches? And what's the population? 8,000. Okay. And, but our challenge is so many people are unchurched and you know we can have an influence on those who go to church mm -hmm. but we have no influence on the unchurched and, and mm -hmm. it's kind of our challenge and we don't know how to solve it. I mean it's, mm -hmm. it's a worldwide challenge mm -hmm. but I, I, the people of this town love this town I mean we can see it mm -hmm. and uh, I just hope things improve for all of us. And I wanted to add a note to what Father Ron said about the uh, public school system here mm -hmm. and also uh, the industrial sector. Jasper has quite a bit of land mm -hmm. that is unused, untapped, and maybe privately owned mm -hmm. or just uh, in a certain family. Mm -hmm. But that land, the land resources here are great if we could have someone trust to bring our leadership here to bring in uh, an industrial company or some manufacturing company and also take the time to educate people in the community for those jobs using the mm -hmm. school resources we have that would help mm -hmm. generate money in this community um, mm -hmm. at a large, in a large proportion. Mm -hmm. and, and then also if, if we don't remodel with the schools or we do those, that's not going to help bring in other UIL events, mm -hmm. um, whether it's sports or academic. And mm -hmm. it, it has to be a remodel on the outside of the inside. Mm -hmm. um, that's just the way society works, and mm -hmm. those yeah. are two keys. Yeah. They really when are. Many of the students go to college here? Well, they leave, and then they, don't, they never come back. Okay, you know. so they go to college and they never they come back. They all over the place, but they never mm -hmm. come back. There's nothing here for them. Mm -hmm. Do you have many of them retire? Do you have people who retire here? A large, large number because of the lakes area. Mm -hmm. Without the lakes, I think we'd be a ghost town. <laughs> And that's another thing I want to stress. Um, it's very important to say is a lot of a lot of the students who do it with me, you know, attend UT and M, some go further further than that. Um, they have gifts and skills and networking. Uh, they've networked with people that, in a way, depending on what they do, could help um, influence their hometown in a way. If they, especially if they're in business or um, even uh, communications. Um, so I think that it takes just a little bit more thinking outside the box of how they can influence the community instead of looking at it as a retirement place mm -hmm. or a place just to, to stay away from. Mm -hmm. But that come that's come through educating students uh, who are already here through the educational leadership in the schools about what they can offer their town. Mm -hmm. Let them know this is their town just as well. This is school is their school. Have you ever had any um, colleges offer like satellite courses here? Or well, we do have now at Junior College, yeah, Angela, 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 Angela College, Angela uh, College. Uh, and a lot of the kids are taking the classes there, mm -hmm. even from the high school, because it's kind of on the high school property ground, mm -hmm. and that's been a big help. And uh, I mean, the night school classes, I believe, are almost always filled. Mm -hmm. So that's a start. That is a start. Definitely a start. Because with education, with knowledge, people become more mm -hmm. better skills for jobs and everything else. Okay, is there anything else that either of you would like to add? Well, I appreciate you taking the time. I appreciate you well, taking the time out of your business. I'm looking forward to, to the completion of your work. Well, thank you. Mm -hmm. Dr. Tate. Okay.